Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back, Matt, Thank and those you. of you who are traveling with the secretary. Yes. Just pull up my opening comments here. All right, I'm going to start with an update on humanitarian assistance in Gaza. Following President Biden's call with Prime Minister Netanyahu last week, in which he emphasized that Israel must take immediate action to protect civilians and get more aid into Gaza, we have seen a number of initial positive steps over the past few days. First, the Israeli cabinet has agreed to open a new northern crossing, which could be operational this week and would represent an important step in delivering assistance directly to northern Gaza, where we know the humanitarian situation is most severe. The Israeli cabinet also approved the use of Ashdod as a port of entry for relief, which if implemented could significant, significantly facilitate the flow of assistance. In addition, we have seen the initial implementation of a streamlined process for regular truck convoys moving from Jordan through Israel and into Gaza carrying essential supplies to those in dire need. The government of Jordan has played an important role in facilitating humanitarian assistance to Gaza, and we commend them for being ready to step up and do even more. Yesterday, 304 aid trucks entered Gaza, the highest number of trucks in any single day since the conflict began. That number represents a significant improvement, but it is important not just that we see the daily number continue to grow, but that it be sustained over time. Our hope is that by later this week, 350 trucks will enter Gaza each day, and we are working hard across the United States government to make that happen. We also welcome the announcement by the, that the IDF is establishing a coordination unit, unit for deconfliction as a direct contact point with the humanitarian community. More than 200 humanitarian workers have been killed during this conflict, and we have repeatedly pressed the Israeli government on the need to improve its deconfliction and coordination measures. The creation of this new unit, which, Prime Minister, uh, which is something President Biden raised directly with Prime Minister Netanyahu on their call last week, and which Secretary Blinken has raised in his meetings with Israeli officials, can contribute to the safety of those who are working tirelessly to bring relief to the Palestinian people. We will be observing closely its establishment to verify that it operates as intended to ensure humanitarian workers can do their jobs as safely as possible. While we welcome these initial steps, it's crucial rec to recognize that much more needs to be done. Many Palestinians in Gaza are at risk of famine, and every single man, woman, and child in Gaza is experiencing food insecurity. So these recent efforts must be just the starting point for a sustained Israeli commitment to ensure that the people of Gaza have their basic needs met. We expect Israel to fully implement its commitments quickly, and we'll, we will be monitoring that implementation. As Secretary Blinken has said, ultimately, it is the results that matter, and we will be judging them on those results. And with that, Matt. Uh, okay, great. So, but. Uh, it, it, it is correct, though, that you you guys have not yet come to a determination as to whether the steps that Israel has undertaken now, in the last couple of days, or is undertaking, uh, meet <clears throat> your I don't want to say requirements, but your but but meet the uh, criteria that you have laid out. It's not you haven't decided that yet. It's something that we are going to assess over time because, as I was pointing out, it is not just important that they take initial steps to facilitate the increase of humanitarian assistance, but that increased flow of humanitarian assistance be sustained over time. We've had these moments before, most notably during the, the, the pause back November when we saw humanitarian assistance increase and then come back down, and what we want to see is a sustained increase. So right. port, new entry, entries <clears throat> open up and they stay open. More trucks go in and they keep going in. But you guys have been calling for these actions for months now. Um, why, what, what, why, why do you think that they now? I, to, right, you have, you can't hazard a guess. So I can hazard a guess, but I'm not going to speak for the uh, Israeli no, government. Right, I, I'm well, I mean, sure. Guys, I'm not since, since 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 December at least, even before. Yeah. You guys have been saying you need to or, or open a, a, the nor, a northern crossing, and then when they did open the one, you said you kept going on about Erez, and, and that needs to be done. Ashdod, the Jordanian line, all of that stuff. You know, in January when we were there uh, in Amman, you guys were talking about how important that was. And now it's April, uh, and it's just starting to happen now. So why? So I can't speak for the Israeli government, 
but I can I can well, I, I, I'm about to I can I, what I can say is we have made clear over time the changes that we wanted to see implemented we've seen some changes over time but it has not been enough and there has been an increasing sense of frustra frustration inside the United States government that they have not taken some of these steps that we have been recommending and urging for some time uh, and the president last week made clear that ultimately their policy needed changes change or ours would all right okay and in the meantime since you've been calling for all this, what has happened on the ground? Uh, a number of things have happened on the ground, but the most important thing that we have seen is dramatically increased food insecurity no, inside I'm Gaza. No, I'm not talking, no. Wait, but he, between, but between, let's, let's That's just why say, I start with a number of things happen say, on the ground and which one, which one you're going for. Let's just say, let's just start from January 1st of this year. Between January 1st and now, April, whatever it is, 8th, what has changed on the ground in Gaza? With respect, well, I'm starting to answer with respect how to food security. You seem to have an answer in mind. How many people are there? Yeah. How many more starving people are there? How many more um, civilian or, you know, uh, facilities, in, in infrastructure, how much more of, of that has been destroyed? Uh, how many more aid workers have been killed? So. There have been 200 aid workers total that have been killed. Yeah. That's really been a constant since the beginning. And we have been making clear that there need to be better deconfliction and coordination measures. And that I will tell you that the step that they are taking now is important, but it's overdue. Okay. Should, it should have, ha right. should have happened so, months ago. A lot of these steps should have been happened months ago. We're happy that they're happening now, but they need to be increased and they need to be sustained. So I'll stop after this, but I, I, in recognizing that um, often hindsight is 2020. Um, shouldn't you have done, put the ultimatum, or shouldn't the president have done that months ago? So we have made clear to them for months what we expect them to do, and we have seen backed them, up by but, what? and we have seen them take steps at our urging, and some of those steps have been important, but they haven't been sufficient. And all I can say is that we welcome the initials that the initial steps they've taken over the past few days. They represent a dramatic improvement if fully implemented, but we're going to judge them ultimately by the results. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if we could um, come to the hostage negotiations. One of the other things that the, the president said to the Prime Minister Netanyahu in the call, according to the readout, um, was that the Israelis should empower, or Netanyahu should empower his negotiators to, to make a deal. Have you seen any evidence of, of a change in, the, in that regard? So I'm not going to speak in detail in, uh, with respect to the hostage negotiations other than to say that there is a deal that's on the, the table for Hamas, and we hope that they'll accept it. We uh, do believe that the Israeli government is ready to make a deal. They want to see uh, uh, their hostages returned, but we have to see Hamas being willing to uh, to accept such a deal. But, but the implication of, of the way that, that, that came out in the, uh, in the readout was that so far, those negotiators hadn't been fully empowered, and there's been criticism from the Israeli opposition that that you know they haven't sought a deal as 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 hard as they could have done. Right? Is that is, is that not the case? We have seen Israel put a deal on the table in the past, and we wanted to make sure, and that's what you saw us uh, uh, speak to in that readout that as these new sets of negotiations unfold, that the negotiators there are fully empowered to make a deal. But it's not true that Israel hasn't been willing to make a deal in the past, because they have been. There have been deals on the table that Hamas has rejected, and there's now a deal on the table, uh, and we, want to, we hope that Hamas will reject it. We believe, as we believed all along, that a uh, ceasefire um, would be in, in the interest not just of the hostages, that it, whose in, uh, release it would enable, but also in the interest of the Palestinian people who are suffering greatly. So you see, now there's a deal which Hamas you hope they will accept. What is what is different about this deal from, from the previous ones that they've rejected? That I'm not going to get into, just because I don't think getting into the back and forth of negotiations is, is helpful from the podium. Yeah. Um, keep just sticking in the region. Um, the Prime Minister just said, like in the last hour or so, that a date for the Rafah invasion has been set. Um, have the Israelis shared that date with the U.S.? To my knowledge, we have not been briefed on that date. And given what the Israelis have briefed, U.S. officials on uh, to date in terms of their plans for, you know, the operation. Um, I assume that what you've seen thus far uh, would not be something that the U.S. would approve. So we have not yet seen them present a credible plan for dealing with the 1.4 million uh, civilians who are in Rafah, some of whom have, been, have moved more than once, some of whom have moved more than twice. 
But even more than that, we have made clear to Israel that we think a full-scale military invasion of Rafah would have an enormously harmful effect on those civilians and that it would ultimately hurt Israel's security. So it's not just a question of Israel presenting uh, a plan to us. We have made clear to them that we think that there is a better way to achieve what is a legitimate goal, which is to uh, degrade and dismantle and defeat the Hamas battalions that still remain in Rafah. So I think, as, as you obviously know, we had a conversation with them about it last week. Secretary Blinken participated in that conversation with uh, leaders from the White House and other agencies of the United States government. There will be further conversations over the coming days, coming weeks, uh, where we can continue to lay out our uh, our beliefs about this potential operation and how they could achieve it in a better way, and we'll go from there. Yeah, Sai. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on the talks, so you're saying that there is a deal on the table and uh, it's up to Hamas to accept it and so on. Now, would that deal include the withdrawal of all Israeli forces from the whole of Gaza? You so think? I'm going to maintain my rule of not commenting on okay. on, uh, potential, on negotiations or what the contours of any deal might look like from this podium. Yeah. I, I fully understand, but would, is that something that the United States would consider, would support? I mean, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of conversation. With uh, you, fu you fully understand and continue to ask me to, to right. violate that rule, which I'm going to refrain from doing. Okay. Uh, so I, not, I only say it with respect. It's just I don't think it's helpful for us to talk publicly about what are uh, obviously very sensitive and delicate private negotiations. Okay. Uh, do you feel we're closer to a deal today than we were, let's say, a couple of days ago? Uh, I'm just not going to comment on the negotiations right. at all. L let me ask you on Rafah. Now, <clears throat> the United States um, uh, rejects any kind of plan that does not include the safe movement of 1.4 million Palestinians from Rafah. So that's not exactly it, Saeed. That's not exactly it. Just as I was trying to say in right. in 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 response to Kylie's question, we don't think a full-scale operation uh, in Rafah is something that we could support in any event because right. we think it would number one harm all the 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 more than 1.4 million Palestinians uh, that are there. Um, Welcome to the briefing, Hiva. <laughs> um, it would harm. It would. It would. Uh, it would harm those uh, Palestinians there. It would hinder the delivery of humanitarian assistance. So we have made clear that we don't want to see okay. that full-scale uh, inv invasion in any event. Right. But is it feasible to really move 1.4 million Palestinians? I think it would be very difficult safely? to do, which is why we have made clear that we cannot support uh, that right. kind of operation. All right. A couple. A couple more uh, questions. You know, um, the Secretary General uh, on. The United Nations Secretary General on Friday expressed concern that Israel is using artificial intelligence to target Palestinians. Are you aware of that report? I've seen the reports. I don't have any further information on them. And lastly, I promise it, lastly, uh, on UNRWA. You know, I mean, if, if the last couple of weeks taught us anything, it taught us that, you know, the only people that really can conduct the, uh, the dispensing of aid and movement and so on are really UNRWA, effectively, simply by virtue of a very long uh, experience. So I, I know that the United States, at least until next year, will not be uh, funding uh, UNRWA. But would you uh, pressure the Israelis to allow UNRWA workers to, to, con to, to, to conduct uh, their operations in Gaza? Would you, would you tell them that the, there seems to be no one else that can do this job as we, good as they can? We have repeatedly made clear to the Israeli government the importance the important role that UNRWA plays in delivering humanitarian assistance and, and said that uh, that work should go on unhindered. Thank you. Okay. I have uh, two questions. So um, you, show, you expressed concern about the fate of 1.4 million civilians who are trapped in Rafah. As you said, these people moved twice or three times at least. Would you accept um, re uh, returning these IDPs to the north especially women and children, because the Israelis seems to be opposing that. And by moving people from harm's way to an area that's being cleared and declared by Netanyahu as no military operation there and Hamas is, is not viable, so why not allowing these people to go back 
to their original home so left from there. we have made clear the secretary has spoken to this on a number of occasions that we do want to see yeah. uh, the palestinian people be able to return to their homes whether they be in Khan Yunus, whether they be in the north now it needs to be safe for them to do so um, they need to be able to return to homes that aren't in the middle of ongoing military activity if there is unexploded ordinance that ordinance needs to be dealt with if there are booby traps um, or other uh, IEDs that Hamas has left, those need to be dealt with so people aren't returning to apartment buildings um, uh, that are unsafe. But we do support the return of, of Palestinians to their homes and their neighborhoods, and we've made that clear on a number of occasions. Sorry, so, how many livable homes it's, in the north do you think that there are in Khan Yunus? How many, how many, so how many actually you talk so, about being safe and so, all that kind of thing? Uh, so I mean, a, the destruction is pretty massive. It, it is a great question. Uh, uh, so uh, where would they return uh, to? A huge number of them have been destroyed. That is without a doubt. There are some homes that are still habitable. There are some apartment buildings that are that are still habitable. It is. Do you it, know it, this? Is, how? Uh, you can look and see the number that there are buildings that are still habitable. People report on the ground that there are buildings that are still habitable throughout Gaza. Now, a massive number have been destroyed, but there we hear from people who want to return either to their homes or they want to return to their neighborhoods so they can start to rebuild their homes, and we support their right <laughs> to do so, recognizing that there is a very difficult road uh, ahead of them. Matt, I will note you never apologize for interrupting me. Right, well, <laughs> well, because he does, I'm not the <laughs> gentle deserve an apology. Fair, fair enough. You followed up for me. Um, <laughs> second question is, Mr. Kirby said uh, on Sunday that, um, let me quote him so I'll be accurate, he said, the U.S. has not found any evidence of Israel violating international law. He refers to the State Department. He said the State Department have a normal process where if there's an incident reported, they will follow up and he, they concluded, you, the State Department concluded, that the Israel has not violated international law. So my no. question to you is, in the face of all the human or the uh, organization, humanitarian organizations working in Gaza, including MSF yesterday, that they said Israel has targeted not just uh, aid workers, but doctors and journalists. And uh, Chef uh, Jose Andres said as well that Israel is committed crime against humanity why the U.S. is not conducting an investigation regarding, regardless of these incidents. So, a full investigation like you asked for, uh, like you asked to be conducted in Ukraine after the Russians invasion. So we do have a number of ongoing assessments with respect to this very question. But we have not yet, we, than we, we, right? they are, that is how we do, that's how we operate uh, inside the State Department is we have a number of different bureaus, experts from across our bureaus that look at uh, facts, uh, apply them to, to international law, and make assessments. Those assessments are ongoing, and we have not yet at this time concluded that Israel has violated international humanitarian law, but we have ongoing assessments across a number of different fronts. So all these organizations are just wrong? They just see the law differently? I'm telling you that we have ongoing assessments, and we have not yet reached that conclusion. Janet, go ahead. Uh, on South Korea, really... I'll come to you, I'll, I'll come to you next, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, on the South Korea's military satellite launch, how does the United States view the successful launch of South Korean's military reconnaissance satellite from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida yesterday? Let me take that back and get you an answer. Thank you. And second one, Russian government summoned the South Korean ambassador to Russia in retaliation for South Korea's independent sanctions against uh, Russia. A spokesperson for the Russian Foreign Ministry denied any treaty in military supplies between North Korea and uh, Russia and uh, criticized that, that South Korea should escape from the influence of the United States. What is the your reaction on So that? South Korea has been an important partner, not just of the United States, but of others in the international community in helping hold Russia accountable for its illegal war of aggression uh, against Ukraine. Um, they have been with the United States and our international partners since the beginning. We look forward to continue to uh, work with them to hold Russia accountable. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Matt's a line of questions regarding the uh, steps that have been uh, taken yeah. by Israel to elevate uh, and ease the uh, humanitarian situation. And uh, I cannot but think that this because of what been reported, the threat of change of U.S. policy toward Israel during the call between uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. And, but don't you think 
because you've been pressed here by press and by humanitarian organizations to do that early, a few weeks early, maybe a couple of months early. Don't you think that you were few, several steps behind, and if you acted this way, by the given this by waving this wand to, to our Israel, then they took the steps earlier. So many lives will be saved. I can only answer that by pointing again to how much we have worked on this question, and it hasn't just been a question of working on it over the last few months, over the last couple months, the last first few months of. Uh, 2024. It's something that we have been engaged in since day one. And if you look at the Secretary's very first trip to the region, uh, just a week after October 7th, one of his top priorities was to open Rafa back then, which was closed, for the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And you saw President Biden on his first uh, trip when he came to, to Israel uh, pressing uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to open uh, Rafa to allow humanitarian assistance to get in. We have consistently pushed to do that, and we have delivered results time and again in getting new crossings open and getting an increase in humanitarian assistance. Now, I think what you have heard from a lot of us in, inside the United States government is that there has been a growing sense of frustration that Israel hasn't done enough and that their policy needed to change and that they allow, needed to allow more humanitarian assistance in. So all I can say is um, when you look at where we are today, we welcome the steps that they have taken, but the, 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 I, I, what I'm trying to get at is, with, in response to your question, this is a is this is not an end of the process. We've seen them take initial steps here over the past few days, but we want to see much more, and so we are going to be watching them over the coming days, the coming weeks, to see that the um, uh, steps they have announced actually lead to improved results. And we will make assessments and make determinations of our policy based on those results. But my question was, don't you think that you, the process is slow? If you push harder by threatening earlier, you will get better results. Because it seems that the Israelis are susceptible uh, to you when you are wave this one. And what I'm saying is we have pushed them on, on a number of things over time and seen them take results. We have seen the impact of American diplomacy. We have seen them open crossings, open three crossings uh, before the past few days to get humanitarian assistance in. We have seen them uh, uh, work with Jordan to allow convoys. And ultimately, what we determined is that the steps they had taken didn't deliver to um, what we thought they ought to. So we had seen them promise to let more trucks come in, and trucks, the delivery of trucks increases, but not enough. And so ultimately, when you look at the past few months where we have seen them make commitments and they deliver on those commitments, maybe partially or maybe for, because of logistic reasons or bureaucratic reasons, uh, the steps that we thought would be fully implemented end up being partially implemented. Ultimately, that's where you see this sense of frustration in the United States government, where we tell them that ultimately, uh, if your policy doesn't change, ours will have to. Now, again, I, I, I want to, the, the point I was trying to make a minute ago when I responded to your question is, I don't want to stand here today and say that everything has been solved because we're not ready to say that. We want to, we have seen good initial steps, but we want to see how they're actually implemented to make sure that there is no Palestinian in Gaza who is going hungry. And until we get to that point, we're not going to be satisfied. My last question is about the Iranians threatening to retaliate on the airstrike that stuck their consulate in Damascus by attacking Israel directly. The Israelis say that they are put steps uh, to ready themselves for such a strike. Do you, are you worried that this will ignite the whole region if, Israel, if it happened? We have been concerned about the risk of escalation since October 7th, and one of the things you have seen is consistently engaged in is diplomacy to try to lower that risk of escalation. Um, we have made clear directly to the Iranian government that it should not use um, uh, this incident as a pretext to attack American troops or um, American f uh, facilities in the region, and we will continue to make clear to them that they should not take any escalatory actions. So just on, just on that, in, yeah. in, in, in reference to the Mexico-Ecuador situation, uh, which you uh, have a problem with, the Ecuadorians going into the Mexican embassy. Um, is it still the U.S. position that what happened in Damascus did not involve a legitimately protected um, diplomatic facility as covered by It is our position that we are still uh, attempting to answer that question, uh, whether it was a consular facility or not.
And if it was? Uh, I don't want to deal with hypotheticals. We're trying to determine the facts of the situation. Well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, this is now several, several days old. What, what, what exactly is it that you're waiting for? We are waiting on a, a final determination. It's From something whom? we're looking into. Uh, we're making our own assessment based on facts and the facts that we continue to gather. From the people that you have on the ground in Damascus? Uh, we have a, a variety of ways to, to gather information. Oh, okay. Okay. What are they? Uh, I'm not going to get into them here, but we obviously have uh, intelligence capabilities. Um, well, the Israelis uh, the say it wasn't, to, it wasn't a legitimate uh, diplomatic. Uh, I understand that, and we're gathering you our own. You don't agree with that? No. I, what I said is we're gathering our own uh, facts and making our own determination. Well, okay. How? By looking at the facts and making a determination. I'm not going to take you inside the process, but we're gathering. Well, uh, I mean, what? Yeah, we're gathering. We're gathering as much satellite imagery or something. We like are. That? We are. I'm not going to get into the exact facts that we are gathering, but I can well, tell you. Well, how are you we are so looking, sure that we, the because, uh, Mexican embassy in Quito is uh, is a diplomatic? It, it is a long established uh, Mexican this embassy. Is, this wasn't long established. That is ultimately the question that we are trying to determine. Even if it was an established though, <laughs> diplomatic facility, and there were also, uh, you know, like IRGC folks in there. Would that justify an attack? Again, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We, I want to, we want to answer the factual question before moving on to that second order one. And just one more question on this, um, this Iran threat that has been discussed by U.S. officials. There are some reports that <clears throat> the expectation is that um, the target is expected to be in Israel. Is that accurate? I am not going to speak for the Iranian government, obviously. Um, I think we would send a loud and clear message to them that they should not escalate in any event whether uh, that means inside Israel or elsewhere in the region. But I'm not asking you to speak for the Iranian government. I'm asking you to speak for um, what the expectation of where that threat right. would and I'm not gonna, is. Right, and I'm not going to speak to uh, any expectation. Our, um, uh, to the extent that we have an expectation, it is that Iran not escalate this conflict any further, and we have made that clear to them. Why don't you want to publicly speak about where that threat is if you guys are saying it's in the region and obviously the hope is to... I think you might understand why I don't want to speak to intelligence matters from this podium. Uh, stay, stay in the region. Yeah, keep to go. Um, you just said that um, you have had uh, direct communication with the Iranian government. Um, yeah. Um, has... Have, you, has, have there been any communications during the past few days specifically uh, since apparently reports out of Tehran are saying that they have set conditions for them not to retaliate, that they've sent messages to the U.S., uh, some reports say via Oman even, and uh, their foreign minister was in Oman on Sunday. Uh are you referring to the reports that they wouldn't retaliate if there was a ceasefire in Gaza? Correct. I can yes. tell you that those reports are not true. They have, they have not sent that message. Um, but if Iran wants a ceasefire in Gaza, that ought to be something they, sh can be, they can accomplish, because they have long supported Hamas, and they could uh, press Hamas that they should accept the deal that is on the table that would achieve a ceasefire. OK, another Iran question? Yeah. Um, the U.S. has cons consistently said that it coordinates with the European yeah. Union on um, actions it takes against Iran, specifically, or one example, sanctions. Now, the European Union has lifted its sanctions on a certain um, company, Arvon Cloud, which both the U.S. and, again, EU said that it was complicit in um, con disconnecting people's access to the Internet. Was the administration um, advised of the EU's decision to rescind that those sanctions on this on this company? So our position on Arvon Cloud is clear. Uh, Arvon Cloud is a key player in the Iranian regime's project to cut off the Iranian people from the global internet and surveil them. As we said when we were designated when we designated them in June, Arvon Cloud maintains a close relationship to Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and Security. And senior managers of Arvon Cloud are either current or former uh, affiliates of the Ministry of Intelligence and Security. So Arman, Arvon Cloud remains sanctioned by the United States. Ultimately, the EU's decisions uh, are up to the EU, but they will re Arvon Cloud will remain sanctioned by the United States for its clear role in facilitating censorship to the detriment of the people of Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Ahead, next I, uh, I'll come to you next. Sorry. Next. About Ecuador's situation, um, the U.S. already condemned um, Ecuador's violation of international law at the Embassy of Mexico in Quito. Uh, but what's next? Are you 
Is the U.S. considering sanctions? And if so, what kind? So let me say that, first of all, we condemn any violations of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. We take seriously the obligation of host countries under international law to respect the inviolability of diplomatic missions. Mexico and Ecuador are crucial partners of the United States, and we place a high value on relations with both countries. Uh, and then finally, we welcome the convening of the OAS Permanent Council this week to address ongoing developments, and we encourage both countries to resolve their differences cooperatively. Considering sanctions? Uh, I don't have any announcement with respect to our actions. I think the next step is that, uh, in this matter is for the OAS Permanent Council to meet this week and address the ongoing developments. We're monitoring that closely, uh, and we'll look to see what uh, outcomes they produce. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how China's support for uh, Russia's war effort in Ukraine has evolved, and uh, also the Secretary's efforts to communicate that and talk about that with allies? So we have been concerned uh, really since the outset of that conflict about the PRC's support for Russia's war against Ukraine, um, and have been especially concerned over recent months about its efforts to help Russia reconstitute its uh, defense industrial base. Uh, we have raised that with a number of our allies and partners uh, uh, across the world. Uh, we have seen in recent months that the PRC has started to rebuild that industrial base. Essentially, they've been backfilling the trade uh, from European partners that was suspended after the invasion uh, and sanctioned, and that they have been helping provide the components that increase Russia's capabilities to uh, attack Ukraine. That, of course, has long-term security impacts on uh, Europe as well as the entire world. And so the Secretary has raised in a number of his meetings with allies and partners uh, around the world um, uh, the need to um, monitor those, um, uh, those results and ultimately take actions to prevent them. Yeah. On Ukraine, uh, last week the Secretary said Ukraine's future is in NATO. We've heard that before, but was mm -hmm. there any discussion while he was there about a timeline for that, or is it still dependent on the end of the war? Uh, it, so nothing has changed with respect to a timeline. We, obviously, there were discussions while the Secretary was at NATO um, uh, about Ukraine. Um, uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba was there, and the Secretary met with him. Uh, but we have made clear um, uh, for some time that ultimately that's a process that, that, that moves forward at the end of this conflict. I do want to say on Ukraine, but before that, very quickly to go back to what you just told Gita about Iran. If those reports are not true, your expectations that Iran will not escalate is based on purely your own observation? I said the report, the, I was referring to the, the reports about Iran no, presenting conditions. to us the condition uh, uh, for a ceasefire. Those reports are not true. But I'm no, not going to speak to what Iran may or may not do. Got it. Thanks so much. And moving to Ukraine, any comment on the Las Vegas attacks on U Europe's um, largest nuclear plant. Uh, how alarmed are you? And what do you know for sure about what's going on? Because we have seen increasing disinformation campaign uh, launched by Russia. So we are aware of the reports of a drone attack uh, at Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We are continuing to monitor the conditions at the plant, including through uh, official reporting from the IAEA, which fortunately notes that the damage resulting from that drone strike has not compromised nuclear safety. You have heard from us before uh, our belief that Russia is playing a very dangerous game with its military seizure of Ukraine's nuclear power plant, which is the largest uh, in Europe. It's dangerous that they've done that. And we continue to call on Russia to withdraw um, its military and civilian personnel from the plant, return full control of the plant to the competent Ukrainian authorities, and refrain from taking any actions that could result in a nuclear incident at the plant. Thanks so much. President Zelensky called for increasing uh, defense aid, defense support, uh, ahead of his meeting with uh, uh, UK uh, Foreign Minister. The Secretary uh, agreed with, with uh, I mean, there was a call between the two, Zelensky and UK uh, Minister. This foreign minister's article today. Yeah, which he uh, called, what was uh, the last part? The foreign minister wrote an article and he called for. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely want to see uh, assistance increase to Ukraine, and that starts here in the United States, where you have heard this administration make very clear that we want to see Congress pass the President's supplemental request, which would provide much needed uh, defense assistance to Ukraine. Thank you. We'll, we'll move to the South Caucasus, if I may. Uh, following last weekend's, uh, last week's meetings, we have seen uh, clashes reported between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, is there any active, uh, let's say, process going on in this town in terms of relaunching Washington meetings? You guys had a series of meetings last, last year. You stopped it. 
Okay. Uh, we have made very clear that we, the path forward for, for resolving this conflict is ultimately at the bargaining table. I don't want to speak to uh, any upcoming meetings, but we have always made clear that we welcome dialogue. When the Secretary has communicated with the leaders of both Armenia and Azerbaijan, he has made clear that uh, there needs to be dialogue between the two parties. We are happy to play whatever we, role we can to facilitate that dialogue, and we'll continue to do so, but I don't want to preview any specific upcoming meetings. Any reaction to the clashes itself? So last uh, let me take that back in Thank you. And finally, if I, may, I know my Georgian colleagues will also press you on that. You guys have put out a statement over the weekend. You said that you uh, reached out to Georgian uh, Dream government and conveyed your uh, concern about uh, the uh, Russian law, yet they moved on, uh, you know, as you know, they uh, submitted their draft today. Um, what is your policy here other than just wait and see? What is our just, uh, policy here, other than just wait and see? Last year, you guys. The policy is the policy that we made clear in the statement that we put out, which is that we are deeply concerned that uh, if it is enacted, this draft legislation would harm civil society organizations working to improve the lives of Georgian citizens. Uh, it would derail Georgia from its European path, and we are concerned that the legislation would impede independent media organizations working to provide access for Georgian citizens to high quality information. Now, this is still a draft piece of legislation, it has not been enacted into law. So with respect to any potential outcomes or any potential steps that uh, we might take, I would certainly wouldn't want to preview them today. I mean, last year, you guys were clear that if any MP votes for that, they will be sanctioned by not by refraining from conveying uh, the same message. Uh, uh, right now, we are making clear that we are concerned with the, this draft legislation uh, with respect to what we might do if it moves forward. Uh, stay tuned. I don't have anything to announce today. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, Secretary Blinken had a phone call with Pakistani Foreign Minister Ishaq Dar on Friday. Could you share some details, like what are the key points? So the Secretary did speak with the um, Foreign Minister of Pakistan on Friday to reaffirm our robust partnership, which advances the prosperity of Pakistan and the United States. The Secretary and Foreign Minister Dar discussed the importance of continued cooperation on counterterrorism, expanding our trade and investment partnership, and advancing women's economic security and empowerment. So is there any discussion on Pakistan-India tensions? Uh, because Pakistan, uh, Pakistan says that uh, Indian government uh, assassinated dozens of individuals uh, in Pakistan, while the Indian Defense Minister appeared to confirm that the Indian government carried out extrajudicial killings in Pakistan. How do you see this situation? So we have uh, been following the media reports about this issue. We don't have any comment on the underlying allegations. But of course, uh, while we're not going to get in the middle of uh, this situation, we encourage both sides to avoid escalation and find a resolution through dialogue. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, I'm going to host the Iraqi Prime Minister next week here in Washington, D.C. Do you have any comments on the recent agreements between Erbil and Baghdad and also the meetings between the IAKR president with the Iraqi leaders and the U.S. ambassador to Iraq? So, and have you urged the Iraqi Prime Minister to settle down these disputes with Erbil before coming to Washington, D.C., as some reports suggesting that? So I'm not going to get into those uh, reports, but I will say that the upcoming U.S.-Iraq Higher Coordinating Committee meeting next week, uh, next Monday, will highlight our shared bilateral priorities and the broad relationship between our two countries, including energy independence, financial reform, services for the Iraqi people, strengthening democracy and the rule of law, and enhancing educational and cultural uh, relations. Representatives from Iraq's Kurdistan regional government will participate in these discussions. The United States supports a strong, resilient Iraqi Kurdistan region with in a sovereign, stable, and secure federal Iraq, and we encourage the government of Iraq and the KRG to redouble efforts to resolve long-standing issues, bringing economic benefits to all Iraqis. You watching a movie, Matt? No. <laughs> I don't. It's like the second. This is the, this is this is this is phone go off in the in the briefing day. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Matt. I just wanted to follow up on uh, Gaza humanitarian aid issue. <laughs> Uh, you said that, you know, uh, these steps by Israel should have happened months ago. So I'm wondering if those steps could have been taken months ago, but Israel did not take them. Does that mean Israel was blocking the aid? Because we had this discussion before in this room and you said you didn't think that they were blocking. No, it says what it means is that there's more that they could have done. And so we have seen them, as I said in response to one of the earlier questions, we have seen them take some of these steps. and then. What has happened on a number of occasions is that ultimately some of the ways that you could increase the delivery of humanitarian assistance break down for a variety of different reasons. And I think that's why you've seen uh, senior officials inside this government get incredibly frustrated that the 
steps towards improvement we thought we were going to be taken ultimately didn't materialize. And it's why you heard me say in my opening comments that when it we look at the actions over the next the past three days, ultimately we're going to judge them by the results. So the absolute could have done more. We're glad that they're uh, doing steps now, but I'm not ready to stand here and make a definitive determination because we want to see humanitarian assistance increase. We want to see it sustained, and we don't want to see any of the problems that have marked the delivery of humanitarian assistance over the past few months reappear. We want to see them resolved, and that's what we're going to continue pushing for. Uh, go ahead. Good afternoon. Yeah. Matthew. Uh, good to see you. So I'd like to ask you about religious, or uh, a question on it. My, my question concerns religious liberty. Uh, I want to ask you about the State Department's proposed rules concerning non-discrimination in foreign assistance. I'm sure you're familiar with it. The, the comment period just wrapped up. Uh, Catholic leaders recently stated some concerns. One is, quote, we respectfully urge State, the State Department, to ensure that NPRM's notice of proposed rulemakings honor religious liberty, end quote. My question, will the State Department honor religious liberty? Of course we will honor religious re religious liberty. Moving on, wait, wait one more yeah, here. Right. The NPR, the, the church, the Catholic leaders also say the NPRM's, the rulemaking, could chill, quote here, could chill Catholic entities' participation in foreign aid programs. What's your reaction to those concerns? So I'm not going to speak with respect to ultimately how we will decide on a specific rulemaking. There's a process that we go through here when it comes to any rulemaking that, incur that includes the solicitation of comments from outside groups and outside individuals. We take all of those seriously um, uh, and uh, ultimately take it into our decision-making process. Yeah, go ahead. All the way in back. Thank you, Matt. I'm wondering if there is a new dimension emerging in the Indo-Pacific strategy given United States constructive engagement with Chinese authority and including President Biden's 105 minutes phone call with the Chinese President Xi uh, in recent days. So our policy with respect to engagement in the Indo-Pacific has been consistent since the outset of this administration. Um, and that is we make clear uh, when it comes to China specifically, which you raised in that call, that there are areas where we have concern uh, with actions that China has taken. There are areas where we want to work together with China to address air, uh, mutual concerns, for example, with the traffic of fentanyl, trafficking of fentanyl, which has impacted uh, millions and millions of Americans. And uh, uh, ultimately, it is our job to manage the relationship responsibly to prevent uh, uh, any, um, uh, any unintended escalation. At the same time, we are going to work with our allies and partners uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific region uh, on our broad vision of a region that is safe and secure and democratic. Is that true The U.S. ambassador in Dhaka, Peter Hirsch, was in hiding just before Bangladesh one-sided election due to alleged Indian pressure. The accusation was reportedly made by a senior Indian diplomat and former ambassador to Bangladesh during a book launching ceremony in New Delhi. Uh, so I haven't been following every book launch uh, ceremony in New Delhi, but no, that, uh, that is not accurate. Not? Um, I have a few other things on my plate, as much as I would like to. Go ahead okay, in the back. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Netanyahu said that military is uh, uh, preparing to move more than million Palestinian civilian out of Rafah and then carry out an attack. Would you please clarify, you repeated many times confirmed that the Palestinian will not be evacuated. Also, how and where will they evacuate? To Cyprus, to Egypt, where? So I don't have anything to add to what I said earlier in the, in the briefing about this very question, which is we don't think that um, Israel can effectively evacuate 1.4 million people, um, that a uh, full-scale invasion into Rafah would have uh, an enormously harmful effect uh, or impact on the civilians who are there, that it would hinder the uh, delivery of humanitarian assistance, that it would actually hurt Israel's national security, and that's something, it's the kind of operation that we can't support, and that's what we remain in conversation with them about. Regarding, excuse me, regarding the uh, humanitarian assistance. In fact, the uh, Muslim citizen of Gaza and Christian citizen of Gaza are not protected, and even the animals are not protected. How many Palestinian citizens should be killed, whether by fire or starvation? So you can seriously intervene. Uh, why United States could 
uh, not link the providing of uh, military aid to IEDF with the allowing uh, human, humanitarian aid into Gaza. We do not want to see a single Palestinian civilian killed. Uh, and that is why we have made clear that Israel needs to do more to improve its deconfliction and coordination measures. That's why we welcome the initial step they took over the weekend um, uh, to establish a coordination center. Ultimately, that coordination center has to work. It has to have aid groups represented inside it to ensure that incidents like the World Central Kitchen strike and so many previous strikes that killed humanitarian workers are not repeated. Uh, and that's what we're going to continue to but press But you could for. put conditions. Okay. To, uh, to put I, I, I've, I've already I've, I've spoken to that. All right, go ahead. Uh, thanks, um, news just broke that Hamas has rejected the latest um, ceasefire proposal from Israel. Any reaction? So I have made it a rule since my first day here not to react to things that happen after I walk out uh, uh, to the podium or while I'm out at the podium that I haven't had a chance to see uh, in in full context. And I will um, largely stick to that rule. But of course. We have seen them reject a number of proposals before that we have um, thought would deliver incredible benefits to the Palestinian people that they claim to represent, most notably uh, uh, cessation of hostilities, but also conditions on the ground that would uh, deliver, uh, that would allow the delivery of much, much more humanitarian assistance. And uh, while the administration has pressed Israel to get humanitarian aid into Gaza, isn't the famine and, and food insecurity ultimately Hamas's fault? So uh, certainly we have seen Hamas uh, hide, behind huma uh, huma hide behind human shields. We have seen uh, Hamas start this conflict in the first place. Um, and we have seen Hamas refuse to agree to um, a ceasefire that would um, enable the delivery of increased humanitarian assistance. And finally, um, uh, with Congress back in session, Ukraine funding is a top agenda item. Uh, reportedly, um, the House version is going to consist of the Repo Act, which would allow uh, seized Russian assets to be um, sent as assistance to Ukraine. And it'll consist of reversing the administration's LNG ban to non-FTA countries. Does the administration support this? Uh, I would refer to the White House for a comment on that legislation. Thank and you. He Thank would, you he would go oh. ahead, and then we're going to wrap for today. Uh, just, I just want to follow up on that uh, strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Uh, you've been saying that you don't want to, you didn't want to expand the, uh, uh, the war, and um, you conveyed message to the Iranian that they, you don't want the, the escalation. But what about your conversation with the Israeli? Did you tell them on on whether this is, was an escalation? So what's your position? We have always made clear that we don't want to see Israel escalate this conflict in any way either. Now, again, we recognize that uh, Israel is the victim of terrorism that is sponsored by Iran. Hamas, principally, uh, has been sponsored by Iran, but Hezbollah, which sits to the north of Israel, of course, and continues to launch rocket attacks against Israeli civilian targets, uh, is, a, is principally sponsored by Iran. And the Houthis, which have been uh, significantly involved in terrorism, especially over the past few months, are sponsored by Iran. So we recognize that Israel is the victim of terrorism, uh, has been the victim of terrorism repeatedly, that is sponsored by Iran. But no, of course, we don't want to see this, es this conflict escalated in any way. So you don't support that? You consider this, this an escalation? Uh, I'm not going to speak to this specific strike, but I'll say we do not want to see the conflict escalated in any way. And with that, uh, uh, I'll take one more. Um, I just wonder if you could shed, shed some lights on Secretary Blinken's trip to China. What's the difference between this trip and the one he had last year? Does he have different message and different mission this time? So uh, we have uh, said that the Secretary will be traveling in the coming weeks. We've not exact uh, announced an exact date for that trip, let alone who the Secretary will be meeting with. So I think I will refrain from comment uh, until we've moved a little closer to that trip. And with that, I'll wrap because I think a number of you probably want to go out and see the and see the and see the. Eclipse. Everyone, everyone, remember, everyone, remember to wear your glasses.